Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and this, oh yeah. Got it? What about now? Now? That's right, it's the blob. You know, well, you probably don't know, but every summer there is a blob fest at the Colonial Theater in Phoenixville, and this is the first year I'm going. If you want to come meet me there, that would be awesome. Anyway, that's not why you're tuning in. You're tuning in because of this guy, the $1,498 Sony RX-10 Mark III. Well, the fact of the matter is, the concept, the, the very idea of this camera didn't really do it for me, uh, going back to the RX-10 originally. In fact, when I was in the market for a camera with a built-in lens, I actually purchased a Sony RX-100 Mark IV. Really small, that EVF, I thought that was going to be great. I ended up returning it because pop-up EVF was a bit of a pain in the neck. You had to push it in before you popped it down each and every time and the uh, range was not nearly uh, as much as I would want if I only had to bring one camera. So when the Sony RX-10 showed up, my doorstep, eh, okay, I'll give it a review. And some of you may have already seen the rolling shutter and the uh, low light noise test. If you haven't, please check it out. But this video segment is going to be on the short side. I'm trying to keep most of them on the short side, Please check out the blog. I've got a lengthy article that goes into much more detail. But here's the thing. So at the same time that this RX-10 Mark III was dropped off at the, uh, at the house, this guy was dropped off at the house too. Finally, the Battis, the Zeiss Battis 85mm 1.8 on my Sony A6300. And uh, you can figure out what I did, right? Just looked at the headline of the video. Uh, I pitted them against each other, and that's not as strange as it sounds. Because at $1,498, the RX-10 Mark III comes with a built-in lens, and for just under $1,000, you can get the A6300, which I think is the boss. I just love this, this little camera. And you can get a couple of good lenses, let's say the 50mm 1.8 E-mount and the 28mm f2. Yeah, roughly the same price. Now, of course, you've got nothing at the long end, but it is fascinating. Fascinating the way Sony is blanketing the market. They're filling every nook and cranny into an incredibly extensive product line, even when they're not making the cameras themselves, as is the case with Nikon sensors or Apple iPhone 6S uh, and S Plus sensors. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. It's not crazy to pit the two against each other, not just on the basis of cost, either. Turns out that this is an exceptional camera. If you only could have one camera and you weren't a trust fund baby, or an older person who has the wherewithal, or a young investment banker, or a doctor, although doctors don't have that much money when they start out, uh, this might be the camera to get. This Zeiss zoom lens, 24 millimeter to 600 millimeter, 35 millimeter equivalent focal length, is outstanding for what it is. I've never peered through a lens with anything remotely like this range as good. And with Sony's clear image, yeah, you can actually double that uh, top end and it's still serviceable. Now, what this can't do is defy the laws of physics. And the 20 megapixel one inch sensor is terrific, but not as good as the APS-C sized sensor in the 6300, nor, uh, of course, as good as the uh, full frame sensors in the A7S II and the A7R II. No newsflash there. Those cameras are $3,000 a pop just for the body. And again, the A6300 
is uh, just under a thousand bucks for the body alone. The Battis 85 millimeter is almost 1200 bucks, 1198, something like that. So just the Battis and the 6300 alone is more expensive than this and you're getting dramatically more focal length range. Now, you know where I'm gonna go with this. This is one focal length, fantastic lens, really beautiful lens. And again, go to the blog post, tell you more about it, but I think of this lens as sublime. Uh, and mounted on the 6300, it's more like 135 millimeter, which is actually my favorite length uh, for portrait lens. So really, really just an exceptional, exceptional lens. And I'll cut to the chase. Uh, the two other lenses with which it most directly competes, the Sony uh, G Master 85mm 1.4, is the sharpest lens I've ever seen uh, at that focal length. But <laughs> okay, it's $1,798, $1,800, something like that. More importantly, it has no image stabilization. Now, that's fine when you're talking about an A7S II or an A7R II, which has IBIS in body image stabilization. It's more of an issue when you have the 6300. So what I would say is that the Battis is actually the better lens choice if you have an APS-C sensor, whether it's the 6300 or the 6000, which is still a great camera, and which, by the way, I'm using to record this now. But it also competes against this guy. Sony's own 90mm 2.8 Macro G OSS, which by the name OSS, you know, Optical Steady Shot, has image stabilization. And this you can get for just under a grand now, so 100, maybe 200 bucks cheaper than the baddest. And the reality is, I ended up buying this lens over the baddest. And why did I do that? I mean, the baddest is just. Wow. But here's some reason why I really like the Battis, aside from how beautiful it is. It's a lot smaller and lighter than the 90mm 2.8. It's got 1.8 instead of 2.8. But you know what? I like shooting up close. The difference in depth of field uh, between a 1.8 85mm and a 1.4 85mm is so small that uh, I couldn't justify it in my own mind. Again, for me, that is to say the G Master 85 1.4, which those of you who have read or seen my stuff before know, <laughs> I just thought was, holy crap. Anyway, long story short, I was out testing the Battis on the 6300. I was testing the uh, RX10 Mark III under a variety of circumstances. When it comes to rolling shutter, they're about the same. When it comes to low light performance, the 6300 is definitely better. One or two stops better. I would say more like two stops better. But the RX10 Mark III comports itself beautifully up to 6400, which is fantastic. I mean, I'm old enough to remember that if you pushed uh, Tri-X, from 400 to 1200 and developed it in AccuFine. Oh baby, you were esoteric. Well, <laughs> it's nuts what we can do now. There are things about this camera that are better than the 6300. It has better ergonomics. What do I mean by that? Well, the first thing is the controls fall much easily to hand. They just do. And one of the things that I really like is that the movie button is right there under your thumb. I still don't know why they can't just have one button do it for stills and for movies, but okay, whatever it is, that's fine. I also like that there is a dedicated exposure compensation dial right on top. Now on the 6300, that's a multi-function uh, button, which is fine, but I kind of like one button doing one thing. I'm probably in the minority that way. Uh, I also like the fact that the modes are on the other side of the top plate, unlike the 6300, which is right there. Not that this is difficult, but what this allows is an LCD uh, display on top, which is very nice, very DSLR-like. It has a deeper grip. It has a thicker body, and while it is definitely 
bigger than the 6300. It is downright petite, and I'm looking for it. I think I left it upstairs. The, uh, it is much more petite than the Canon 1D. The viewfinders on both of these cameras are lovely. I'm not sure why. I think maybe it's just the depth of the hood on the back of the viewfinder. But the RX10 Mark III actually has better uh, eye relief for me with my glasses on. Now, there are other things about the Ergos that I prefer on the RX10. Here's a big one. The card slot is on the side of the body, which means you don't have to take this off the tripod, out of the gimbal, or whatever to get the card out, as you do on the 6300. The flip side is, it's probably not the card that you're going to be changing most often. It's going to be the equally Pez-sized batteries on these two cameras, in which case it doesn't matter that the card is on the side, you're still going to have to take it out, turn it upside down, and pull out the battery. All right, that's fine. What else do I like about uh, the Ergos? Well, let's, let's just say that one of the things that I really, really like is that this wheel on the back, same kind of wheel that's on the 6300 here, allows you to move a flexible spot focus point without delving into menus. That's definitely superior functionality and ergos. But let's talk about what else it does beyond what the 6300 does. It has a headphone jack. Okay. All right, I've managed to figure out how to get by without the headphone jack on the 6300, and it is a very compact body, but it would have been nice if they've had it. The RX10 Mark III has it. Really good. Really like it. And that range is phenomenal, and this lens is really sharp. I'm walking the pooch. Maybe you saw it in an earlier video, and I see a plane in the distance. I rack it all the way out. I, I was stunned to find a second plane coming in below the first plane I spotted. And uh, wow, I wouldn't have caught that with any other camera because no other camera that I'm going to be walking around with is going to have this kind of range. And it was beautiful at the wide end as well. So yeah. There's a lot to like about this lens. It's not just sharp, it doesn't just have range, uh, but it's snappy. It's really snappy. Now, on the other hand, there are a number of things that the 6300 does better, and you've already heard me uh, allude to one of them. It has a better sensor. Oh, you know what I didn't tell you? They both have 120 frames per second. They both use the same codex, XAV-CS. Uh, they both have the same bit rates, 100 megabits per second, 4K. They both shoot 4K. 50 megabits per second, 1080p. But this guy will shoot up to 960 frames per second. Now, 960 frames per second is cropped, and it's kind of ugly, but there may be scenarios where that's what you want. You're willing to make that trade-off, and then you've got it, and you don't have it here. On the other hand, the 240 frames per second, and even the 480 frames per second, they're reasonable. Holy cow. So, okay. Back to the 6300. Better sensor. Better low light sensitivity. Higher resolution. It holds together better. If you pixel peep, and of course if you're watching this video, you're going to do a little pixel peeping. But I encourage you not to. It's really about the totality of the image, the totality of the footage, the emotional impact, the, the storytelling that, that we do through images and footage rather than ultimate, ultimate, ultimate resolution. But 4K uh, imagery on the uh, RX10 Mark II, uh, Mark III is great. The 4K imagery on the 6300 is better. And you can see it actually without pixel peeping, especially when it comes to noise. Now, the next thing, which is really the big thing, the advantage that the 6300 has, is that it gives you choice, of course, because it's interchangeable lenses. Now, I'm a prime, fast prime kind of guy. And one of the thing that, things that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about the RX10 
Mark III is that the effective maximum aperture, this is a variable aperture zoom, is somewhere between f kind of 6.5 and f11. That's the maximum. You get to the 35 millimeter equivalent of 120, 135 millimeters, and you're at f11. f11. You can't get the bokeh with the RX10's zoom that you can with a dedicated prime. You can't get the close uh, minimum focusing distance that you can uh, when you're not in macro mode. But by the way, this does some beautiful macro stuff. The 6300 also has superior autofocus. I could not get the RX10 Mark III to consistently track moving objects. It's not just about bokeh, and it's not just about degree of background blur. You are giving up a lot of light by using a zoom lens with this maximum aperture. We're talking four or five stops. That's a big deal. Even in daylight, that is a big deal. Because all else being equal, let's say when you're shooting uh, stills, you open up the Zeiss or any of the other primes, and you can reduce the ISO. You can have that larger APS-C 24 megapixel sensor giving you its best output. You know, it's kind of like ISO 100 versus ISO 6400. You have the absolute best quality uh, that the larger sensor can provide versus the absolute limit of what the smaller sensor can do and be okay with it. And even to the naked eye, you're gonna see a big difference between those two uh, uh, ISOs. In use, I got great images from both of these cameras during a family portrait shoot that I did at the Philadelphia Art Museum. Most of the shots that I liked the best, in fact, came from the 6300 and the uh, Zeiss Battis 85 millimeter 1.8. It's just a creamy, gorgeous combination. Really, just superb. And then at one point, I wanted to uh, play with 12 millimeter. And of course, 24 at the low end of the RX10 Mark III's uh, Zeiss Vario Sonar is great. I think that's a great bottom end for a zoom lens, uh, 35 millimeter equivalent. On the other hand, I love 12 millimeter on the 6300. That's the equivalent of about 18 millimeters. And so I got some great shots like that and really enjoyed it. Again, on the other hand, I didn't have the ability to get telephoto compression. Uh, with the one lens that I had in the tele range, the Battis, and the Tuit, of course, was, was not appropriate. Now, what the two cameras have in common is they've really got great sensors. They're tuned differently. They're slightly different sized. But, wow, Sony is clever about the combination of functions and price points, and they're just blanketing the market. I mean, there is so little daylight in their product line from broadcast, you know, sports broadcast, major league stuff, all the way down to, to phones and everything in between. It's, it's really incredible. They both have the same codec, XAV-CS, uh, as I said earlier. They both are limited to 8-bit 420, which, by the way, when you're talking about web distribution, 99 out of 100 times is, in fact, fine. If you want really just seamless gradations, late evening sky, early morning sky, well, 10-bit will make a difference. And differences in bit rate will make a difference. But other than that, wow. Neither of them has a touch screen. Uh, no big deal for me. 
unless the entire user experience were extraordinary and truly took advantage of that touch screen. There's precisely one camera I've seen that, can, uh, I, that I can honestly say does that. That's the $33,000 Hasselblad H6D. Check it out. Uh, it's, it's lovely what they've done and they are the benchmark in, in my book for the user experience uh, in software controlled cameras. So, what's the bottom line here? Let me give you an odd reference point. If I were serious about making films and moving up from an iPhone I think I would move to this camera. You know, a 128-gig iPhone 6S Plus is almost $900. This is $600 more, and you get a lot more. In fact, again, if you only could have one camera, or I'll be going to Europe later this summer, I'm thinking about traveling really light and simple, I'd have to look really long and hard at this guy. Now, I'm thinking, what if I could get my hands on the Sony RX1R Mark II, which is a fixed 35mm full-frame camera? Could I get through 10 days in Europe and be happy with that? Or if not that, what about the Leica Q, which just looks gorgeous when I held it in my hand back at Photo Plus Expo. Oh my God, that's a 28mm lens. Could I be happy with that one focal length? Irrespective of price, this guy is a compelling alternative. But I have some time to figure that out. Uh, and yeah, you know, maybe what I really want is a fast 400 millimeter FE lens for the 6300. And then I'd be kind of done except they don't make one of those yet. And to the extent that one should be jealous about equipment and in the overall scheme of human experience to be jealous about any of this stuff is silly, but I aim to be entertaining. So if uh, I confess a certain jealousy toward Olympus's 300 millimeter prime, you understand why. Well, that's about it. Uh, an extraordinary camera, another extraordinary camera in the Sony lineup. Not for everybody, but I think that where this camera is going to be most interesting, I think it's going to be people who are about ready to move up from a point and shoot or a phone to a DSLR. Because the simple fact is, you can do about as much as anyone is going to do with a DSLR who isn't an advanced uh, user and it's going to cost you a lot less and it's going to be a superior video machine. Okay, what else can I tell you? I think that's it. But I'm sticking with this guy. I'm Hugh Brownstone, Three Blind Men and an Elephant. See you next time. If you like what you saw here, please thumbs up, uh, subscribe, tell your friends, and uh, see you next time.